really, really fascinating panels to, to choose from. Hey? Um, and I really appreciate you being here. Um, I do not speak Spanish, I'm very sorry to say. So if anybody uh, needs me to, to speak or to help, please just raise your hand so we can figure something out and we can maybe place you next to someone who does speak Spanish. No one? Everyone is, is comfortable in English? Okay. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you. Um, so today we're going to talk about the Democratic Action Fund. Um, we are here, and I'll just speak a little bit about the Democratic Action Fund idea. This is really, um, I'm thrilled to be with all of you because this is more of a discussion. This is a product that a colleague in, of mine, Peter McLeod and myself, have been putting together, the concept, and we're sort of testing it and talking to different audiences about this. So uh, I'm, I'm hoping to provoke some questions and ideas so that we can all together make this product a little bit stronger. Peter McLeod is the founder um, and the executive, he's the founder of Mass LBP, uh, which is one of the leading deliberative uh, organizations in Canada. And they've been doing deliberative platforms at many different levels for over 15 years. Um, I'm Marjan Esasi, and I am very new to this. So I, this is my third career pivot. I'm a litigator by training, and I spent about 15, 17 years in international development, uh, working all over the world on global uh, governance issues. And in 2015, I didn't feel comfortable traveling all over the world and working to strengthen or trying to strengthen democratic institutions abroad, and really wanted to focus more on the United States. And so I applied to Johns Hopkins, uh, just defended my doctoral degree last summer, and initially the problem statement for me was really uh, citizen disengagement from political institutions. I was very eager to try and see what types of solutions might re-engage citizens. Didn't know very much about deliberation, um, but was very eager to learn more. Uh, I created in my dissertation, which I won't be sharing with you guys today, but a definition for what an engaged citizen really looks like and what types of variables I think are important based on work that many, many great scholars have done for decades. Um, and then wanted to test those against solutions that are being offered. It was at the same time that Macron announced his Citizens Convention on the Climate. So I based my research on three case studies. One was the French Citizens Convention on the Climate. The other was uh, the Parliament of Brussels. The city of Brussels was doing a pilot at the time, which has now become a permanent part of deliberative committees. My second case study was that on homelessness. And the third was working with Peter in Canada on a national citizens assembly called the Citizens' Assembly for Democratic Expression. And so that's, oh, and we lost the screen. Oh, there we go. All right, so that's kind of me. I'm currently with the Bergeron Institute as a fellow, uh, part of their Future of Democracy program. And, um, and so here we go. So all of us who are here today are here because we all care ex very deeply about democracy. And democracy is a simple but very, very complicated word and has different definitions for every single one of us in this room. But it is an audacious proposition. And you know, we, we, we've talked about it over the past few days. It's either moving forward or it's falling back or it's kind of in place and it's atrophying. And it's always being tested. And you know, you're all very familiar with these concepts, but is democracy in crisis? We hear about democracy dying. Um, but it is constantly being tested. And so for hundreds of years, uh, we've tried to build these frameworks. But even our, you know, one of the, the elements, which is kind of how we define democracy, which is based on elections, is still incomplete. And so I wanted to share with you a few thoughts that we have around what type of things are sort of undemocratic or not democratic enough about our democracies. And here, um, I'd like to sort of, oh, oh it's not showing. Huh. Uh, what's, no, but it's a cut in, I mean, there's slides that I've just pasted. It's such a tease, you're all ready to go to the graphics. <laughs> sorry? It's such a tease, we're ready to see the graphics. Yeah, I'm sorry. And it won't actually show them on my own computer, which is strange. Oh, well, that's disappointing. Um, 
All right, well, uh, there are three slides. <laughs> I'll, I'll just describe them to you. Um, so the, the University of Maryland School of Public Policy um, released a, a, a report last year. It's called Demand for Public Consultation, and some of you may already be familiar with it. But in the US, we talk very much about sort of democracy by, for, and of. Uh, of course, yes, thank you. It's good that we have a lot of time, so yeah. I think we have until one o'clock. Yeah. Is what sorry? Okay. Yes. Join. I I think they're trying to figure it out. I don't. Oh really? Do you need a hotspot? Um, no. I no. Yeah, okay. 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 Let's come on to it. Yes. No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. We've been through this. <laughs> You missed this morning. I, I this morning when they couldn't get people on the in the big tent. I thought anything that happens in our small conversation is fine. No, it's okay. It's all right. We'll just well, I'll just describe the three slides a little bit. It's not a big deal. Sorry, it says what? The file is a PDF file. Oh, can't you just open PDF? I have a PDF actually here. Um, oh, it worked? Yeah. Okay, let's see. Maybe it will pop up like a. Because the, right, but maybe she has the PDF separate from the PowerPoint, where she can just click on the PDF. Um, yeah, let me see if I can do that. Oh! Wow. Who's the brilliant person who suggested that? Brilliant. All right. That's really amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So let's do this this way. Um, okay. Except that it's... All right. Well, that's fine. I'll just slide it up and down, I guess. So um, as I was saying, the University of Maryland released this, I thought, very compelling report. It's obviously based in the US, I think it's about 4,000 voters. But it's quite telling in the way that we, at least in the US, describe democracy, which I think lots of people do in terms of like by, for, and of the people. And here, um, as you can see, the slide by the people is really, the question was, do you believe currently that there is an adequate system in place for the for the voice of American people to be heard in Congress. Nationally, 83% said that there is not an adequate system and 17% said that there is an adequate system. So that's for, to me, that's always very telling in terms of by the people. Yes, do you want me to and go back? And it's worse after Trump. Yes. Because you did it, you have a... Right exactly, record. there's a 2018 and then a 2021. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Um, and then when we talk about for the people, you know, are, are citizen preferences really reflected in policy? Um, here again, you can see that th there's a wide gap and ever since 1967, 68, it's just been opening and opening and where currently 91% of people think that government is actually run by a few big interests looking out for themselves, um, which is also quite depressing. And then finally, of the people, 
Um, do people think even elections are adequate? And here I think is also fascinating because 88% said elections alone are not enough. 11% said elections are fully adequate. So what we're interested in is if elections are really not adequate, what is happening in between elections? And um, here, and I have an article here, if you'd like to pick it up at the end, Peter and I had an op-ed in the Toronto Star a few months ago in which we talked about the quiet revolution, although frankly it's not really very quiet, um, but a quiet revolution which is underway internationally to make people part of the policy-making process and dramatically extending the privilege of representation. And these are, of course, as you know, combinations of either participatory democracy, deliberative democracy, direct democracy, as we are here to discuss um, at, at the forum, or combinations of, thereof. Over the past decade, there have been more than 500 citizens' assemblies that have taken place throughout the world. Um, for those of you who are not very familiar with citizens' assemblies, I just put a little uh, collage together of four that I have been very involved in. Um, the first one is the Brussels Parliament Deliberative Committee, which, as I mentioned, was a pilot when I was there, and it's now a permanent structure within the, uh, the Parliament of Brussels. And what's very unique about this type citizens' assembly, it's that it's a hybrid assembly and therefore you have MPs working with um, randomly selected citizens. Canadian CAID, which happened last fall, 2021, which was the um, citizens' assembly on democratic expression, it was a national effort. And then the French citizens' assembly on the end of life, which I'm currently uh, one of four guarantors for, and there's a session, session six is actually happening right now, and we have two more sessions of uh, report writing, and this is a national citizens' assembly with 180 citizens um, to really look at end-of-life issues and pr make proposals to the First Minister's office on whether, among other things, assisted suicide and euthanasia should be introduced into French law. And finally, Petaluma in our very own California and the United States, which happened last year and was uh, implemented by Healthy Democracy. Um, so this is just to give you an idea of some of the variety that we're seeing. Um, we believe that these citizens' assemblies represent the future of a more inclusive, consensus-based representative democracy. And so I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the trends that we're seeing. So these types of, um, these types of platforms are touching different, different areas. They're touching constitutional issues, they're touching parliamentary issues, they're touching regulatory issues. And can, can I ask, of course. Are, do you have this posted somewhere online that we can go back and... The present, no, but I can send it to you afterwards. I'd be happy to share it with well, you. Would be helpful, man, of course. That's better sure. to do it through the, through the group. However, so other people can have it. Or, we'll, we'll make sure it gets out. Let's, let's continue. I would be We're happy. You'll, get, you'll do this, Joe. Yeah, 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 we'll do it. I would be happy to share it. Um, so these three different areas and then the different levels of government that are involved with or without direct democratic components. Of course, the national one that everybody knows very well is the Irish Citizens Assembly on Abortion. I keep saying we need another really good case study. <laughs> it's been almost 10 years. And this was the one that, of course, um, connected citizens' assemblies to constitutional reform and was extremely well done. And then the French citizens' assembly on the end of life, I'm happy to discuss this a little bit more. Citizens are asking to have a, a direct dem democratic component. There's lots of discussion around whether the end of life is really a moral issue, in which case it cannot be uh, become a referendum, but I think some of us believe that we can sort of try and interpret these things a little bit differently. But that's still a question mark. Um, at the local level, of course, there's the Parliament of Brussels, there's the Ost-Belgian model that we, we heard about yesterday, and there's the city of Paris as well. And then, of course, there's the supranational, the Conference on the Future of Europe. And then we're moving more and more from these ad hoc um, setups to institutionalized citizens' uh, committees, which are embedded within government uh, bodies. And of course, there's the Oster Belgian parliamentary model. There's a national German Bundestag, which is also setting up its own citizens' assembly, and then the city of Paris, which I just mentioned. So for us, the question has been, how can we ensure that high-quality deliberative processes become a central feature of our democratic culture? And I, I would like to go into sort of some of the weak weaknesses that we have perceived, but let me first talk about the solution and then I'll talk about what we think this, this kind of responds to. And so we are proposing the Democratic Action Fund, and our rationale is that each year mature democracies spend billions of dollars to conduct elections and operate their councils, leg legislators, and parliaments. And if you add campaign expenses and political communications to the mix, the annual expenditures grow considerably. 
Most industries, any business that you look at, typically spends about 3 to 5 percent of their revenues on research and development. But democracy really has never had this kind of a budget, uh, which we believe is part of the reason why the pace of democratic innovations is slow, slower in some places than others, but still slow, relatively speaking. Democratic action funds that we're proposing are a mechanism to tie funding to electoral budgets and invest in democratic innovations that deepen our democratic culture in between elections. Here, we're asking elected governments each year, and I will at the end, if you're interested in, go into the timeline and what we're doing and how we're, we're trying to, to, to sort of have, a, have some early adopters, but we're asking elected governments each year, and this is at different levels, not just at the national level, it could be at the municipal level, it could be at the state level, regional level. We're asking elected governments each year to commit 5% of what they spend to run their elections to fund democratic innovations like high quality deliberative processes that can meaningfully engage thousands of residents and citizens. So we're focused on cultivating the space between elections for more participation and deeper engagement. And here, I will take a minute. So some of the reasons for Peter and myself, and having Peter having spent a lot more time, but myself as well, and I do, even though I'm very new to this, I spend night and day thinking about this. Um, some of the gaps that I think for us were really important, and I think the DAF, the Democratic Action Fund, can respond to are one, I think there's a problem of acceleration. So yes, we do see innovations and we do see them becoming permanent structures, but even so, you know, we see three a year. There are three citizens' assemblies a year. What the Democratic Action Fund will allow is it will allow accelerated citizens' assemblies. So you could have citizens' assemblies at the city level happening at the same time that they're happening at the state level. No one's owning them, too. So it's not like you know, a parliament is owning them or a city is owning them. Anyone can apply for a grant and anyone can, can, can kind of propose a deliberative platform or a digital platform, and we can go again into that. Thirdly, and this is really important, it equalizes opportunity for citizens. So as an example, the French Citizens Assembly on the End of Life, and most of us you know, are offering stipends and offering to travel costs, but a national assembly, it was very difficult for us to recruit women because it was very difficult for women from different parts of, the, of France to come to Paris for nine sessions over nine weekends. And so what we're hoping to do with the Democratic Action Fund is to allow these processes to happen at different levels so that more citizens can actually volunteer. Um, so that's one piece. And then two pieces that I think from a practitioner standpoint and research, researcher standpoint are also important. And I think they're, they're, they're gaps that we have in our, in our um, deliberative world, certainly, are one, best practices. I think there has been such an explosion in parts of Europe especially that as practitioners, we're not really sharing best practices. And so I think that we're doing a lot of these platforms without necessarily understanding what's working well, what's not working well. And I think creating a setup, and the Democratic Action Plan can do this, where best practices are created and then shared, I think is really important. And then, as a result of that, we can also start thinking about minimum standards, uh, which I think are also really missing from our universe. So going back to the numbers, the 5%, what does it represent? So as an example, Canadian elections, for instance, um, cost 500 million. So a Canadian DAF that would be able to address these problems at the, at the, at the Canadian level would be about 25 million a year. Um, and, and, and for those of you who aren't very familiar, typically citizens' assemblies, whether they're national or they're local, they cost anywhere between 200, 250 to about maybe 450, 500 thousand dollars on the, on the more expensive side. Ontario elections cost 70 million. So if you had, if we were to set up an Ontario Democratic Action Fund, it could be 3.5 million could be allocated for it. The Toronto election, 12 million. So the Toronto DAF would be about 600K. And I was really interested, I was reading the articles, and I don't know if anyone is here from INE, um, but INE, the budget for INE um, in the paper, it said that the budget for INE is 760 million. So 5% of that would be $38 million that would allow deliberative platforms across. Is that the budget of Elections Canada? Yes. Yeah. So how would it work? So this is kind of a very, very kind of um, initial idea of what it could look like. We are absolutely wanting to have randomly chosen citizens involved in the agenda setting. So the proposals would go, the DAF would be set up, the Democratic Action Fund would be set up, 
it, and again, it could be at a city level, it could be a national effort, it would be set up and you would have proposals coming in. You'd have a committee of randomly selected citizens that could be you know, selected for a year's term or two year term, which I think is a much better idea. They would review the proposals. Then there would be the secretariat of the fund and then awards would be allocated. And awards are made on a cost share basis with successful proponents. So that's kind of the idea for the fund. And again, we have no desire to manage these funds. It's really, this idea is more of a movement building idea, something that we could hopefully sort of gather around and talk about and hopefully uh, implement in different places. And then the types of award, there could be reference panels, it could be deliberative town halls, citizens juries, deliberative polling, although I'm not sure that's necessary. I'm kind of a little bit obsessed with deliberation. I'm not sure they're, they're truly deliberative, but, but, but no, we could definitely try and fund those as well. Digital platforms, other digital platforms, and citizen engagement, and then of course citizens assemblies, whether they are tied to direct democracy or not. Um, for the time being, this is very new. We just launched it. We just set up the website about two months ago. We've had some support from organizations that have come to us and said they would like to support us, and we really appreciate their support. And um, we've set up a website that's in the process of being developed. We've received some funding to be able to kind of develop it further. And we're hoping to work with, with sort of uh, colleagues all over the world and set up some meetings, hopefully spring and summer, to have at least one early adopter by the fall is our hope. And, and that's it. And I would love to open it up. Please ask questions. Poke holes at this. Tell me what we're not thinking about. And of course, if you have similar experiences, there are you know, structures, um, different places. Italy had a law to be able to do this. The French CESU is an establishment that could be kind of a democratic action fund, but they don't have the budget for it. So there are different pieces that, that could come together in different parties. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Uh, a simple question. Yes. Is democratic innovation only based on the citizens' assemblies, or do you see it a much wider, a much wider range? No, I think it could. It could absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, it could address any uh, oh, type sorry. of. Yeah. No, it could be reference panel. It doesn't even have to have a deliberative component to it. It has mostly their yeah, deliberative okay. platform. So like, Yeah, 100%, yes. I think, I think the idea would be if a democratic action fund is set up, then within that setup there would be a mandate for what types of awards would be made. And at that point, I think any democratic innovation could be included in, yeah, I mean, this is mostly because of our own interests and what we have, yes. have experience with. But yeah, absolutely, it could be the, a wide scope. Yes, Yannick. Yeah, thanks for the, the presentation. Of course. Very interesting and it's a hot topic in discussion, in, mainly in Western democracies, mm -hmm. which was open for, for some conversation. I have like several questions coming. Um, uh, I just edited a book, a handbook on citizens' assemblies with me, Taushan, yes. and Julian Dijak. We'll be published in a month, more or less. It's uh -huh. ready for publication. We have 27 chapters mm -hmm. with one, some of the main scholars on the topic, like the Irish academic team promoting the, the, the team, the guys of the Germany and all that. And from this book, um, some concerns I have, I mean, I, I'm, I see with positive eyes citizens' assemblies, mm -hmm. but they have some concerns mm -hmm. of the scope to which this should be implemented or with promoting that before resolving some issues which are already on the table. And let me mention, for sure. instance, the uh, idea of citizens' assemblies resolving the problem of legitimacy. Mm -hmm. Because I think we academics or activists, or we see this with very good eyes, yeah. and we have good reason. Mm -hmm. But when we see the evidence on how public opinion perceives that, we have I mean, the evidence is that they don't know. And when they do know, mm -hmm. there are some studies, we include a chapter on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are not enough information. This is one point. We don't not have enough information on what the people think. Yes. You know, it's a kind of general argument that are more representative because are descriptively representative. Yes. But it doesn't mean that the people is authorizing these institutions. Do you know what I mean? It's not because 
I assume that people are like it, mm -hmm. but we don't know. And I think something which connects with electoral politics is missing in there. We need a kind of information, mm -hmm. authorization, more on that. And are you, then, sorry, can I just ask, are you speaking yes. about the legitimacy of the Citizens' Assembly, the body, yes. and, and then in connection with the maxi public? That relationship? Yeah, or? I mean, the general idea is that Citizens' Assemblies can resolve the democratic sure. deficit. Mm -hmm. But how can we resolve the democratic deficit yeah. if people does not know that yeah. this exists and nobody asks them mm -hmm. sure. if they would like it or not? Right, right. And then a right. second dimension, and there are several, yeah. I will mention a few maybe for a conversation which I yeah. think is, is really relevant, uh, is with the um, social movements. Mm -hmm. Because, again, some social movements were really promoting that. We yeah. know there are plenty of pictures. I did several presentations, and, and you know, in Germany, or we want climate uh, citizen assemblies. Yeah. But then, once these experiences are spreading, mm -hmm. one like it's not like systematic evidence. Are things we have to consider is that are problematic for social movements. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a kind of first hand uh, uh, information I have in some experiences for politicians. Yeah. It's much easier to deal with citizens' assemblies because you have citizens as individuals. Mm -hmm. And most of them are not well organized or in a framework. Or, so it's much more like, let's say, mm -hmm. peaceful. And of course, it's one of the yep. expectancies. Yep. But at the same time, these intermediations, which are I think very powerful mm -hmm. for uh, any community, are deactivated. And there are some tensions. Felicetti is uh, writing on that. And, uh -huh. and I think it's the second level we have to consider. So again, I'm not against yeah. that at all. Yeah. But one point is what we expect from that. Yeah. What we expect, because this is also not clear. Mm -hmm. We expect to resolve the problem of legitimacy or to improve the democratic governance. And we have some scholars saying that citizens' assembly will arrive to solutions epistemically superior. Yeah. And I don't no, see it's yeah. true. It's yeah. not true at all. And then there is also an issue with the expectancy of having through citizens' assembly a kind of pure neutral discussion. Uh -huh. We are talking about politics, and uh -huh. we should be more respectful on what politics means. This is not to you, it's the related yeah, no, to the conversation. The anti politics <laughs> is yeah. hurting democracy a lot. So, what we need is informed, and you know, once you organize and yeah. you have the experience, uh, the, for instance, the selection of experts is fundamental. Yeah. And we said, yes, we want to do it when. Yeah. But you know, China can do it at the of local course. level of course. and reinforce governance, yes. and we have some yes. evidence they are using. Yes. Not sorted, but this kind of assemblies so, yeah. to improve governance and legitimacy. So you're, you're speaking, and I love your comments are completely valid. You're talking about, in my mind, two different things. One is really questioning citizens' assemblies, which I think is very important for us to do. I'm, a, I'm obsessed with citizens' assemblies, but I see so many holes in them, and every single one of them that I have huge weaknesses. But you said something that was interesting to me. You said that we think that they will solve democratic deficits. I, I don't think that they will, personally, I don't know how others feel, I don't think they will solve democratic deficits. I think that they are a very healthy supplement to our democracies, our representative democracies. What I do see is, yes, there's a problem of legitimacy. Yes, there's a problem. And I also, one of the big issues for me is trust. We often talk about how citizens' assemblies will increase trust. I actually don't think they increase trust in political institutions, but they do result in citizens that are far more engaged with their political institutions. And on that front, I do think that they are, trans they are potentially transformative. Um, but I agree with you, there are a whole host of problems. So, Let me yes, just one yeah, yeah, thing. yeah. I think just to complete the yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, that's not the, the issue of this panel. Uh, yeah, and that was the second thing. The second piece is whether there is, this mechanism isn't just about citizens' assemblies. This mechanism is a fund that can be set up yeah. by some government body um, to be able to engage with citizens more on many different levels, not just citizens' assemblies. So I would love to have the conversations about citizens' assemblies, but perhaps we can do that at the end when we talk about the Democratic Action Fund a little bit more. Yes. Uh -huh. but there are different platforms. Do, do you know about Canoca? Uh, 
Yes, of course. Yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and they deal, they address climate, climate assemblies, and it's yes. wonderful to have a platform yeah. like that. Yes. But that's, and, and that's where a lot in the platform, they yes. discuss all the, the, you know, the, the faults of the things that are not perfect yet, and um, uh, the, the things you're raising. But, um, but now it's about, you know, the strategy to get the democratic uh, fund. Yes. Yes, exactly, to have a fund so that we can do this a little bit more. But that's a great point. Kanoka is, for those of you who don't know, is run by Graham Smith, and it is a wonderful platform for knowledge sharing of climate assemblies, which have exploded as well all over. Yeah. Um, there, was a, there was a question, Josh. Yeah, um, I'm Josh Leonard, uh, Secretary of the Power, and for a couple of for democracy, and also one of those platforms that's synthesizing knowledge around these kind of practices and making it accessible. Um, I guess first, I, mean, I love the idea in general. I've done some things like this already in the U.S. before, in mm -hmm. a previous job um, at the participatory budgeting project. And the framing of um, taking a certain percentage or, or fixed amount mm -hmm. to support democracy, I think would resonate with a lot of people who recognize the kind of wasted money that goes into elections now, and there's a lot of frustration with that. So I think that it taps into a very important problem that people recognize. And that's, there's a lot of do you know those people, Josh? <laughs> I mean, because I, I think there are a bunch of us that would love to approach them. <laughs> I think uh, in many places, people yeah. are frustrated with the amount of money that's going into uh, politics. Yes. Feel that it's uh, so there's a problem, a uh, frustration, a deep frustration this taps into, mm -hmm. and people don't have a solution to mm -hmm. that necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's what I like about this is it's saying there's another way you could spend the money. Mm -hmm. uh, that voters something that is better. And also people. give control to people. Right? Yeah. Give the control yeah. to different so we, levels. We've had success at, 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 in the particular budgeting project, and the framing that could be useful is like a certain amount per capita. Mm -hmm. So we said when we yeah. brought particular budgeting to the US, it costs around a dollar per resident. And when you frame it as a dollar per resident, that seems like very little. Mm -hmm. But it adds up to give a good amount of support yep. in the process. Yep. So this is another option to put out there. That's interesting, yeah. Uh, so we've had success with it, and we've got a few ballot measures passed that have dedicated funds like in New York and Boston for these kinds of programs. Hmm. Uh, the, the biggest question or I think area for growth for this yep. is that um, it's still a question of necessity, but I think it's arbitrarily limiting its appeal by just focusing on deliberative democracy right. as the solution rather than a solution. Yeah. And so the way, and this is partly a broader discussion around deliberative participatory direct democracy. Mm -hmm. A lot of the language around assemblies now is saying we believe in democratic solutions such as citizen assemblies. Yeah. And it's saying this is really the only thing, uh, and that in doing so you're limiting your power mm -hmm. unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. So I would say if this was broader, yeah. we would sign on to it. But the fact that it's saying that it's only and the the, the, the language is all it's just deliberative democracy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, that is the solution that your people aren't going to be interested in. It. A lot of people who would be it was broader. Yeah. So I would encourage opening this up. That there are many solutions. Mm -hmm. It's not all about sortition. Mm -hmm. And that if you can do that, I think there's a lot more appeal for this, mm -hmm. and you have a broader base of support. I appreciate that. I, I, I point taken. Thank you very much. And I think I will just say that our pers our our hope is not for us to fund this and. Yeah. The really large hope that Peter and I both have is to really open the floodgates for everyone who's interested in citizens' engagement on any level. So I, I take your point. And one last quick thing. Yes. It also applies to how it's structured. Yeah. The way it's structured assumes that the only legitimate way to structure something is through sortition. Yeah. Um, so we, we run a global funds like this that is structured around participatory budgeting. Mm -hmm. Where people vote for how to allocate funds. That's also a valid way. Yeah. Than one is better than the other. Yeah. Um, but also you could, I think, interrogate what is the governance process for this yeah. and be more open about that. Great point. Thank you. Thank you. Are you generally more in favor of voting over certition yourself? No, I think, I think they're both useful in different yeah. ways. Just need to be more flexible and uh, less cultish around our institution. Under thank you. Thank yeah, you very much. You in particular, I think you're not doing this in the no, I, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Yes? Yeah, um, my first response here is, uh, earlier you made the statement that as developers, we're not sharing our work enough. Yes. You, you recall? Well, look at the surprise we have when she says, I'm about to publish a book. Uh -huh. yeah. It's got 27 chapters. 
studying this. And so I'm glad Joe was going because yeah. I've been after him saying, you're the central organization group for this. You should have this on your page. Mm. And he says, I'm going to do it. Months later, nothing's there, nothing's there. So I write back, how do we do this? Nothing's there, nothing's there. In Athens, when they started democracy, it was a citizen participation group. Mm -hmm. And it, it was so different than now because they just called all the, uh, right. all the farmers in, who were the heads of families, thousands of them. And I don't know if people all know the story how that worked. Every two months, they called a thousand farmers in, sat them in an arena, and they argued the points. And then they were gone. And then another, the next two, two weeks, they brought another one. And they went through a two-month cycle until they could get all 6,000 people participating. Mm. So it was baked into democracy from the beginning. And I'm sure it's continued in many, many forms. And this is why I'm, I'm emphasizing this point about sharing our work. That's the that's what the main focus is, is how do we we have to bring all this information together. Mm -hmm. There's a thousand pages mm -hmm. that written during this conference. And I'm after Joe, is this going to be published? Are you going to take all these? Well, I think poor Joe needs 20 Joes around him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a very small team. Yes. Yes. For, for me to get the value out of the conference, yes. I, I would like to see all the presentations transcribed. Mm -hmm. Because I, I think slowly and, and read carefully. So, But that, that was my point. And I think. Thank you. It's a, it's a good point. Can I just follow yes. up to that? Um, maybe instead of waiting for them to, to connect all of us and, and get March on slides, I see you have a notepad there. Could we share our emails? And yeah, I'm happy to share. You could send it with us yourself. Well, I would be so. I would be happy to share. Yeah. It doesn't solve all problems. Okay, it solves. That's a good point. This is a good thing to take back to the group because I, what I thought was going to come from the from the community is to say these are the people who are at the conference who are willing to share their emails with one word or two that tells us what their what their interest was at least to connect us because we don't want to I'll, I'll pass this around if you'd like me to share the presentation with you please just uh, put your email and I'll share it with you so that's perfect thank you yes oh go ahead of course I'd like to see you seek a sponsor in the state legislature on this and building upon Josh's um, idea of a broad unit. Um, one of my biggest accomplishments for my eight years on the Santa Monica City Council was to have increased our public local channel funding to cover local elections, where we gave a lot of free time to candidates to speak and then pro cons on the ballot measures. Where, where was this? Santa Monica. In Santa Monica. I was bummed that Joe left. Our common friend, Greg Cole, when he was our city manager, started, you know, so happened this, started to cut the funding mm -hmm. for that and cut back on the programming. And then under COVID, when our budget dropped out, um, all city TV funding is gone. Mm -hmm. We have no more program. And what we used to do is we would have two minute sessions on five key issues where the candidates would speak, and then it would go on 24-7 for the full month before the election, as soon as the absentee ballots started arriving for people. Mm -hmm. So I just did an op-ed, and I'm happy to send it, um, you know, to share here how I felt that rather than the approach that you're saying, of course I hadn't heard of your approach, but rather than expecting cities to be making these decisions upon themselves and having the level of democracy vary around the state, mm -hmm. just like we have the school board spending yep. um, in all of our tax system issues, that there is a state-mandated mm -hmm. democracy fund specifically yes. to level the playing field. Yes. And um, with the surplus that we recently had, it would have been a rounding, area, uh, rounding error excuse me, yeah. to set that up and if it's a dedicated fund so that the legislature can't touch it, then we're safe. And it yes. goes right and so I'd like to see you at least think about that, developing that concept more broadly, yeah. and maybe we could find something in the legislature. I know my state senator, Ben Allen, is very open to that sort of thing and might be a supportive person. That would be great. I would love to trade some contacts with you. I mean, I live on the East Coast, and we are speaking to, to Westmore. 
and the governor, the new governor in Maryland, is interested in doing some work, but who knows? We would love to. I mean, my fear is that we're actually being drawn into conversations with European countries a lot more because they're much more ready than the U.S., so I would love any leads, any contacts in the U.S. That would be wonderful. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Yes? Um, two questions. One very practical. Uh, I'm the mayor of a small city. Yes. We don't have a huge budget. Mm -hmm. I'd say that our election costs in a year are probably somewhere in the area of a million dollars. Yeah. Yep. And they're not very flexible. You know, we have to pay the registrar for the county. We have to, you know, we recently waived candidate fees, which is great, but we have to program money for that. So how does a small, very small city with a pretty small budget and not a lot of flexibility with it get access to this if the cost of this is usually between two hundred and five hundred thousand dollars I mean, the, from what I know, the ones that I have seen have typically cost, even national ones can cost $250,000. So Cade, for instance, was around that. And it was national effort and you know, it culminated in five days in Ottawa. Travel costs, food costs, all of that. So I would guess, and I'm not, you know, I don't put these budgets together, but I would, I would expect that if you were eager to do something like this, something could be done on a smaller scale. Um, and I'm happy to sort of talk to you and work with you to see if you're interested in doing this on a city level to see what types of budgets we could come, to come up with. I think more than anything else, you know, it sounds as a mayor, you have the political will to want to do something like this. And I think it would be really exciting um, to try. There might be philanthropic support that we can find, you know, across. There are all sorts of different ways of doing this. Um, but I would be happy to talk to you if you wanted to sort of do an ad hoc one first before you set up a democracy action fund. We can think of ways to do it that's kind of more innovative. Great. And my other question or concern, yep. which will be familiar to anyone who was on the, the, the panel yesterday, um, on the Healthy Democracy uh, workshop, is you know in my city we have things that are not like quite like this, but yep. things that are uh, trying to be a little like this. We have commissions and committees that mm -hmm. are citizens who apply, so it's not random. It's self-selected, and then mm -hmm. the council appoints them, mm -hmm. uh, and it's volunteer. They aren't paid, which is a big difference. But they are trying to accomplish the same thing of getting citizens involved with the process and create something that will go to the council for passage, yeah. and that people can know about, and they can attend the meetings, they can comment on them, all of this stuff. But a big problem we face with these is that people get very frustrated and discouraged and annoyed at the process mm -hmm. because sometimes it's an issue of they send something to the, the council that is not workable, that mm -hmm. is illegal for us to pass as it is. And we uh. say, we have to do something about this. We want to do it. And they say, why don't you pass it now? And there's just a huge miscommunication issue and that stems from also a issue of communication of the limits of government. Yeah. Of there needs to be people involved in these, telling the, the citizens who want to be involved or trying to think of inventive ideas without stifling them, yeah. what's the real limitations of the sure. body they're working with? Sure. How do we get past that and how do we make it so that people don't come out of this saying, well, we did all this work, but they could dismiss it or they won't do it exactly how we want it, yeah. which may be a good thing that we don't do it exactly how we want it, but yeah. It's sort of a hard thing to communicate in a way that people are happy with. I mean, I think, I think your question goes to the heart of some of the issues that, that, that any of these forums have. And, but you mentioned it yourself. It's communication. So I think that, you know, I don't know how your committees are set up, but if you have an orientation session and during that orientation session, citizens are made aware of what rules there are, what limitations there are, then you can avoid some of that frustration. I mean, I've seen so often very reasonable limitations create such frustration and disappointment in citizens that they actually question why they're even involved, which is kind of what you're suggesting. The Brussels Parliament was fascinating to me because the city of uh, Brussels, by law, the Constitution, will not allow members of Parliament to vote with citizens. Perfectly reasonable. They cannot vote together. So at the end of the Citizens Assembly that I was, the deliberative committee that I was involved with, at the very last session, they told citizens that the votes on these proposals that they had co-created would be separate. So citizens would vote separately and members of parliament voted separately. 
why that wasn't communicated at the first session, the second session, just to set expectations, to this day is unclear to me. But again, that's a perfect example of setting the, the expectations and making sure that citizens understand is a great way of preventing those problems. We're having a similar issue at the Citizens Convention on the end of life currently, because the CESE, which is the institution that is organizing this, thank you, that is organizing this, is going to be submitting its own recommendations alongside the citizens' recommendation. But citizens haven't been told about this. And so what we as guarantors keep asking the CISR to do is tell them, like notify them, so that they're not then surprised, which of course then makes the experience for citizens very disappointing. And then they question if it's just, you know, it's just a show, it's not for real. And so there are all these different pieces that work together. And, you know, the truth is, it's a process. I think whether it's citizens' assemblies or more broadly other types of citizen engagement, I think we're all learning. And I think that we shouldn't shoot them down just because we haven't gotten the formula right yet, I think. Go ahead, please. Hi, I'm Gabriel. I'm right now representing the NHL of GYC. And I wanted to share an example that I think would be relevant when it comes to the conference on the future of Europe. Yes. 2021-2022 was uh, this, it was a deliberative process in which citizens would meet with members of the European Parliament and reflect on the future of Europe. At the beginning, it was very broad, and then it became more specific. Um, there are a few outcomes within a involved as an organization in different kinds of ways. We facilitated um, some uh, deliberate processes um, on behalf of the European uh, political parties. We had our own uh, projects funded in the context of this. Mm -hmm. So we could see different kinds of dynamics. A few maybe learning outcomes from all these processes. Mm -hmm. It was usually not clear what is the outcome. Yeah. So I think whenever there is um, such a citizen assembly, any kind of consultation, you need to be very clear what is the final outcome and mm -hmm. what you expect them to provide you with, which mm -hmm. kind of inputs, and what you're going to do with these inputs. And you need to provide a time frame. That was the second mistake that mm -hmm. we generally saw. Uh, it was not very clear what are all the steps mm -hmm. and their timeline. And this creates frustrations and unavailability. You recruit someone and you mm -hmm. expect them to be available for three steps, but you only tell them at the beginning, would you like to join on Saturday for two hours? And then they find out there is another option and another option. I think this is a mm -hmm. mistake. Then uh, it's important to clarify the format. So if you want to involve politicians or, or NGOs, mm -hmm. it's important to clarify what's the format. Do they come as observers? Are they coming as any other citizen? Because they are at the end of the day citizens as well. Mm -hmm. uh, because we saw that sometimes members of the parliament were showing up. They wanted a lot of uh, media attention, etc. So if you have this kind of media attention, which is n normal for a member of the European Parliament, mm -hmm. me as a citizen that I'm joining that uh, platform, I will not feel like that I'm equal with that member of the European Parliament. Because when the press is coming, they will only interview the member of the European Parliament, not me. So I think the format is uh, mm -hmm. quite uh, important. Uh, the funding, it was very different mm -hmm. because European political parties had their own funding, so they mm -hmm. need maybe some of them even offer, offer stipends mm -hmm. uh, to allow people to participate. Mm -hmm. NGOs designed it in their own way. Some were offering yeah. food, some were not. Some were doing it online. It was also this period of COVID. Some mm -hmm. were doing it only offline. So it was very, very mm -hmm. diverse. Also, uh, there was the created a platform where it should be the um, outcomes of those little discussions. Mm -hmm. But it was not mandatory for the organizations that were funded to fit into this platform. So I think another mm -hmm. learning outcome mm -hmm. is that if you are funding mm -hmm. such a process, mm -hmm. you need to be more transparent and to put in the same platform. So mm -hmm. if we speak about the Democratic Action Fund, and let's say in the state of California is aiming to finance, I don't know, $1 million into five different kinds of actions, all of them has to have the same time frame, mm -hmm. feed into the same platform, mm -hmm. in order to put together at the end of the day. 
and I'm more in favor of have, that's a good practice that I think we could take from the conference in the future of Europe. Mm -hmm. I like the diversity of actors that were behind these processes. Mm. What I didn't like was there was no coordination between these actors. Mm -hmm. Some of them were taking funds from the European Parliament, others from the European Commission, others from Erasmus Plus, different kind of funding national fundings as well, mm -hmm. so it was a, quite a diversity, also mm -hmm. eligibility of course was quite different, mm -hmm. so I think everyone that is involved in the process should have the same role, the same timeline, yeah. fitting into the same process, and, and at the end of the day having the same outcome yep. that is proposed, and finally, the proposals were discussed in the parliament, mm -hmm. but some of them are not possible to be actually implemented right away right. because it needs a sort of a change of a treaties. Mm -hmm. So it might be possible but yeah. very difficult. Yeah. So that's why that's a consequence of uh, being too broad, being too dreaming too high mm -hmm. and not having clear outcomes. Mm -hmm. What do you want from those citizens? Yeah. And when it comes to the future, future is so large. We are thinking about future in million ways, yeah. having million ambitions. So I would suggest for a democratic action plan to have very tangible outcomes, mm -hmm. very clear for everyone, yep. and um, to find a way that is not debatable afterwards yep. uh, about money being spent uh, uh, yep. without being correctly just. Thank you. Gabriel, I think you raise a couple of really, really interesting points, and I think that your example of the future of democracy is also very interesting. I think that that's one of the things that we're hoping the Democratic Action Fund can also address in different places is the question of continuity. Because the lessons that are learned, are they going to be implemented for the next one so that we can make sure that each time we do these things, there's an improvement, right? We've learned from the process as you're suggesting and then we, we take those lessons. I mean, often we'll see that either implementers are different, facilitators are different, and there's no understanding of what happened before, what the pitfalls were so that we can be stronger. So thank you for your comments. So uh, my question, uh, you have an international perspective as well as an American perspective on citizens and families. Why is it that Europe, yeah. in, when it comes to doing things, is so much more interested in this subject than um, America? I've been following citizen assemblies for um, some 30 years. Yeah. I named my son Solon, who was the first oh. inventor of citizen assemblies Beautiful. in the early 1990s. And my organization is I, Solon. Yeah which it picks up on, on that theme. By the way, for those who don't know, in 500 BC, <laughs> Solon developed the Council of 500 to set the agenda for the Boulay. Athenian Assembly. Boule, that's right, yeah. So, you know, we have no shortage of academics in America yes. interested in this subject. If the American Political Science Association last uh, September, was dominated by American academics, but every case study was outside of the United States. You go to the National Association of Nonpartisan um, yes. Democratic Reformers in the United States. Uh, these are the mucky mucks. There is not I just one don't person. Like to reflect on things. That's, that's what yeah, well, <laughs> not one. We reflect. We just don't do the anything. Deals, about it. It's just not. Uh, 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 many proposals yeah. have been proposed to politicians yes. in the United States. I introduced the first one in the early 1990s. I chaired a uh, commission in. Vermont for the Secretary of State of Democratic Innovation. We brought in Jim Fishkin and whatnot yeah. and whatnot. You know, couldn't get anywhere with this. Well, maybe it's because you brought Fishkin. Take, yeah. take it yeah. of, of a certain mindset. Yeah. So why is it? I'll That's just give good. you one possible. Yes. You showed early on the, uh, one of those distrust of institutions. Uh -huh. that we've got Gallup and Pew. They're, co they're constant polls. But there's not one that I've seen on the distrust of average Americans to other Americans. Mm. And this is hard to pull mm. because everybody lies when they're asked this question. Politicians yep. give lip service. Oh, they love democracy and public participation in theory, but not in practice. But it isn't just the elites. I think the average American is incredibly mistrustful mm -hmm. of their other citizens. I would love to see some decent polling on that mm -hmm. subject. I would also like to see comparative information about Europe. Are Europeans more mistrust, are more trustful of each other than Americans? I'm somehow I thought that Europeans, with all their violence and conflict, would be less uh, trustful. But I actually sort of think that Americans are less mistrustful. And it's pretty hard to have 
to focus on citizen assemblies and public participation, yeah. if at the end of the day, Americans really in their hearts are very hostile to other Americans and so, their judgment. I don't, I don't know, that's my theory. I mean, you've raised so many different points. We could spend two hours just talking about what you raised. I'm definitely not in a position to tell you about the American sort of history with citizens' assemblies. I've lived in the U.S. for 20 years, and in fact, after my doctoral degree, I accepted Bergruen's offer to be a fellow with their Future of Democracy because I was interested in moving, turning my lens from all my case studies abroad to what's going on in the United States and what levels of government I should be sort of working on. Sadly, almost after a year of being a fellow, I have spent 80% of my time abroad because there's so much more interest in having me engaged in all sorts of different efforts abroad. And so I don't really know. I think that we use the distrust as an excuse, to be quite honest with you, because you see in Europe tackling some very, very sensitive issues. The end of life is not an easy one. I've been, you know, since December we've been doing this in France. And whether it's for religious reasons, personal reasons, cultural reasons, the French are very divided in terms of assisted suicide, euthanasia, and yet they're able to come together from all different parts of France and talk to each other. I would like to think that average Americans would do the same and that they would show the, each other the same level of civility. And this is why I'm obsessed with citizens' assemblies because I do think that information phase really changes things. When you have people, and yes, the you know, the selection of experts is a question, and we do have to do a better job of making sure that it's balanced information that they're receiving, and the experts that they're meeting with are all very balanced, and they're sort of, you know, they, they span um, the different orientations. But I don't think that we mistrust each other more than Europeans do. I don't think our sense of community is quite the same. So I don't think that we're much, I think, and this is just little me's opinion, so I'm completely open to anybody else's thoughts, I think that we're much more individualistic. We're much more, you know, capitalism drives us, individualism drives us. And so I think that even our politicians are less likely to think of, of forums like citizens' assemblies as a positively positive tool. And then let's also not forget that we're still having massive issues in the United States around elections. So when I, for instance, speak to my congressman, Jamie Raskin, who's actually one of the most progressive, but he, you know, he can't really pay attention to this because he is so either on the January 6th commission or he's dealing with election issues, which are fundamental blocks of our democracy that are still not working. And so what I usually say in response is, well, because those fundamental blocks are not working so well, we should actually be introducing these other types of engagement, citizen engagement. But that only goes so far. So I don't really have an answer to that. Sam, maybe you do. No, I, Share with us. Not, not about that. Yeah. I have a question about the, the, the um, democracy action. Yes, yes. In your in vision, uh, how uh, it seems to me you're suggesting it should be funded by government primarily. Is that true? Yes. And, and, um, and if it's funded by government, then um, I, I worry. I worry how it's going to be conducted. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of trying to do the things that you hope that it would do. Mm -hmm. uh, some, uh, I worry about that because when I see government-funded institutions uh, tend to fall into a trap mm -hmm. of doing what dominant government wants to do, not really right. you know, doing for citizens. So uh, I'm just yeah. raising the question as yes. to how you envision that, that going forward. I mean, I think that you raise a valid concern. I think that, generally speaking, it's a good question to ask. For me personally, um, I do think that part of the problem that we're having generally with our democratic deficit is that there isn't a strong enough partnership between government and citizens. And so I am interested in mechanisms that tie government, give a lot of freedom to citizens, allow them to be the agenda setting, you know, do the prioritizing, the agenda setting, the writing, all of those things with, with obviously facilitation, but I, I believe the government needs to be a partner in these processes as well. Um, but, but your question is a, is a valid one. I, yes. I, like yes, to please. The point I wanted to make is I'm really struggling with the yeah. whole strategy on how to get this budget for this uh, democratic action fund. Yeah. And I do know the moment you define everything that's happening, like citizens' assemblies, but also like the right to challenge, which you have in a lot of uh, communities there. Mm -hmm. 
have the right to come up with their own proposals and to yep. take over things of government. There's also a referendum, uh, the right to organize a referendum. These are all, these rights are all written down at a certain moment in laws, in local laws, mm -hmm. national laws, and with that comes a fund or money to, when it happens, that the government will pay for that at that moment. What I'm struggling with is, mm -hmm. if you make a fund for um, a lot of different tools that can be developed, or that can be developed, yeah. is that it's not a right, that it's, um, uh, how do you say that, it's, it's almost seen as a gift from the government or something. So uh, again, I don't have the answer, because yeah. I'm struggling with that, but I, in the Netherlands, I've been working on referendum laws, and, and also on local level, mm -hmm. and I know that all the time that I've asked for, you know, you should have neighborhood rights, you should have referendum rights, you should have uh, citizens' assembly rights, mm -hmm. that um, uh, that gives it a, a, a more solid base mm -hmm. to, to ask after that for money, or that they have to set apart some money for if the, in the case that citizens are going to use that right that they have. So the, the way that we're envisioning, though, is yeah. that government bodies would be applying for funds. So you would have, for instance, a city, the mayor of a city, or you would have a member of parliament apply for funding oh, okay. to be able. So it's not, not it wouldn't be citizens applying ah, for funds. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I should, I should have made the thank you for raising that. Yeah. That wasn't clear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, we're not. We're, we are envisioning this being government bodies that are creating platforms for, for citizen engagement, not for citizens who apply. But I'm, I'm very curious. I'll, I'll look into the rights that you have because I'm, yeah, I'm curious to seeing how that could be tied. Yeah. In you have the localism act. Yeah. And that um, uh, make, made it obligatory for local um, uh, counties yeah. to uh, city councils to when citizens would step up and say, I have the right to challenge. Right. They, would, they have to make that paper. And in, the, in democracy, in the yeah. direct democracy, it's a healthy mechanism. Yes, of course. To come together and to initiate something instead of the government deciding you are going to have a referendum. No, that's the wrong referendum. Yeah. You want a referendum where we want a referendum. Right. But, it's, it's, so, but there should be a law yeah. for those rights. And with that law comes budget in the case that, you know, like Amsterdam has done right. a referendum law. Put aside like three or four million euros just in the case that a, a referendum will be initiated. I see. But the city itself is not initiating the referendum. That's very interesting. Yeah, that, I understand that in the context of direct democracy. I guess for us, when I talked about sort of accelerating these types of platforms, it was for different levels of government yes. to be able to, to apply for funds to be able to, to implement them in their different localities. Yeah. But I, I, I'll make sure that that's more clear. Yes, Gabrielle. Are we looking at the maybe state level allocations and then local level uh, become beneficiaries? Uh, can you give us more? Yeah, it's a great question. I don't know that I have the answer to all of these things. Um, yeah, so of course, of course. So, so for instance, and I keep going back to the French model because that's the one that I have studied the most recently. Um, so the CESU, so the government, so Macron announced there's this Council for Economic and Social Affairs. That's a, a, it's a nationwide um, association that used to be the association that dealt with civil society as well as unions. Two years ago, they, so they implemented the Citizens Convention on the Climate that Macron had three years ago. Since the Citizens Convention on the Climate, Macron wanted to give them a little bit more power. And so he has now adopted a law that, that makes the CESU the third assembly, basically, of the Republic. And it is, in, it is responsible for relationships with citizens. Okay? So in a, in a perfect world, if the CESU also had its own budget, which it doesn't, it receives money if there's, for instance, the Citizens Convention on the End of Life, which they currently have a budget of about five, six million for this, which is rather large. Um, they eat very, very well, I can tell you that. <laughs> but um, uh, but uh, so the idea would be if the CESU, for instance, had a budget of 30 million, let's say 35 million, then different parts of the French government, whether it was the city level, 
So one of the things that was very interesting to see, and, and many of you probably are aware of this, is what happened after the National Citizens Convention on the climate is, even though it was a national, and there are lots of questions about you know, how it went and whether it was effective or not, but what it did do is it really pushed climate change to the mayoral level. And so many, many mayors today who run elections in France are making campaign promises to hold citizens' assemblies on climate in their cities. So for instance, they could apply to the CISO, for instance, if that was the structure for the Democratic Action Fund, for funding to be able to do that at their city level, right? Or you could see it being done at regional levels. Like if it was the state of California that had a Democratic Action Fund, then the cities could do this. Possibly, if their neighborhood bodies that are administered by government, then perhaps neighborhood could also apply, you know? So it, 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 could, it could be seen in different ways, I guess. It, it would really also matter where the Democratic Action Fund is set up. Is it a nationwide effort, which would be wonderful? Is it a citywide effort? Is it a statewide effort? Does that? I think it's critical that you have an independent board. Um, I, my guess is that any early adopter is going to insist on having some representation on that board, you know, which we currently have in a lot of places. There's a 50-50 of government elected officials and then citizens. But yes, absolutely, I think it should be citizen run. You're asking such good questions. Yes, please. Uh, a couple of short follow-ups and then a suggestion for your fund. Yes. Um, for the transcript. There is software that can take audio and turn it into text. Most of the workshops have been videotaped. The problem is simply sometimes what the original language is in. I would have been happy to pay an extra $10 to have funded a transcription service in Avidex. So that was possible. Mm. Um, I don't understand from your comments and your comments the lack of clarity when people get on these boards and commissions and citizens' assemblies. For our boards and commissions, our advisory boards and commissions, there was always a member of the city attorney's office at their meetings or at the most important meetings to clarify what's possible or not. We have an annual board and commission dinner where the city attorney's office is there and explaining everything. And it shouldn't be that difficult. Communication. Um, to your point about being concerned about the implementation, it's very common to put out a request for proposals to look at which nonprofit organizations can run appropriate processes like some sort of municipal advisory body, mm -hmm. some sort of citizens assembly, some sort of democratic action fund process. Mm -hmm. And you award public funds by setting a standard in your request for proposals of the body has to be able to do these sort of things. So you award the contract based on their history of doing this. So it's it's done all over. And so it's not impossible to find organizations that do these things properly. And there's a great history of cities funding them. My suggestion for you sure. is that if you are working with the governor's office in Massachusetts, just like Alec does from the wrong side of things in the United States, Alec is the American Legislative Council that comes up with these terribly conservative laws that they share with all the states to wreck our country. But if you could come up with uh, sample laws mm -hmm. based mm -hmm. on that experience that both states and cities could use, that would be Thank an you. ideal product coming forward. Great suggestion. Thank you very much. Yes, Amy. Uh, yeah, something I would like to share, again, a bit controversial, but I, I want to share that. <laughs> if, uh, if if you ask me or if someone asks me, would you advocate for such a thing in the Latin American context? Mm -hmm. I would say no. Mm -hmm. Today, I would say no. You know why? We have two new electoral autocracies in Latin America, according to the Varieties of Democracy mm -hmm. report, Guatemala and El Salvador. And Mexico is facing a lot of tension. Mm -hmm. And if you, I mean, in this, uh, particularly in El Salvador and in Mexico, the presidents claim they are with the people yes. and they have a lot of electoral support. Yeah. So this idea to somehow provide them with an argument which could be quite strong mm -hmm. to go against elections mm -hmm. to implement some 
forms of deliberation at the local level without clearing, yeah. with a lot of controversy yeah. on the shaping and so on. Yeah. So, uh, um, yeah. Not, not the right setup. Sadly, yes, I appreciate that point. Very good point. Thank you. I think we had a couple comments, and then I'll come right back to you. But the tension is coming in yeah. Hungary, yeah. in Poland. We face. Yes. So, I know the focus is different, but I think we have to keep an eye also yes. on a good framing. Yeah. Because we have to be, I think, very responsible in a moment in which global political systems, now we even can't say democracies. Yeah. We have more and more hybrid regimes are facing such pressure. Yes. No, you're absolutely right. You definitely need lots of guardrails in, in any kind of setup like this. Go ahead, please. Sorry. Um, can you talk about, do you know of any um, data on perceptions the French have towards this kind of, you know, uh, provision of local government for elections that they have to some sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, I'm thinking of democracy vouchers and other uh, mm -hmm. and finance systems that directly provision people. And it does a magical thing. We see yeah. the data where they become like, you know, supercharged citizens. Yeah. They feel they were all, we all are on the same level. Mm -hmm. We all have the opportunity to participate in our own ways. And I'm wondering if there's a way to translate this idea uh, along the same lines. Yeah. Um, I love those ideas, those, both of those questions. On the first one, I don't have any of the polling that suggests. Um, my lens outside of the Democratic Action Fund is my research is all about how these types of platforms actually impact citizens. And so I will tell you that the research around that is very strong. Um, but I don't know the connection to the maxi public. I mean, again, going back to the French Convention on the Climate, one of the most extraordinary pieces of that for me was that of the 150 that were part of the Citizens Convention on the Climate, 13 of them, 13, almost 10%, didn't go and volunteer for other people's campaigns, but ran their own elections the following summer, which is extraordinary. So we see that impact. We see that they're more involved. Um, are they involved in ways that we want them to? I'm not sure, but they are involved and they're more engaged. So that's important. That's an important piece for me and my research. Um, your question about the democratic vouchers, I think, is a really, really good one. I would think that if we did set up democratic action funds in some kind of a, a, a territory, that that could be one of the things that we could apply to then create in that you know, in a city, in a municipality, wherever we did that. So I think that's a really interesting idea in terms of a program that could be initiated potentially, if that makes sense. But great idea. And, I, and, I, and I'm conscious of the time. It's a little after one, so if anybody wants to leave, please do. I'll, I'll stay around because this is riveting to me. So thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. And I'm happy to take other questions or comments. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You've given... Oh, is it? When is it coming out? In May. In May. Everything ready. We went through the last revisions and so on. So and what is the title? It's the Handbook on Citizen Assembly. Okay. Perfect. Thank you for sharing that. And we have also a chapter who was asking about public opinion and connection to the media. Yeah. That's fabulous. In our view, of course, with different views. Some things are yeah. more negative, like you've seen a lot of things. Yes. Positive. Yes. Sorry, yes, good. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. I was wondering if we should make a distinction between two categories mm -hmm. of civil assemblies. One that empowered legislators and the other one intended to hold legislation accountable. If you look at the citizens' assemblies in Europe, yeah. they are primarily uh, legislators. Uh, Thank uh, you so much for saving my Pushing onto the citizens' assembly controversial issues on abortion. Yeah climate, same-sex marriages, as opposed to what I would call democratic reforms. Sure. And that's an important distinction. Yes. Just to motivate it, 
when uh, President Obama ran for office, he ran on an open government initiative. Yes. His first initiative, first executive <coughs> order, yep. was on open government. Tens of millions of dollars went to the Democratic reform community on open government because they thought they had somebody who wanted open government for democracy. But actually, all he did was open government for things like consumer products, safety, yes. and access to government services. Yes. They didn't deliver. It's an important distinction. It is an important right distinction. There. I think we can we can end it. Thank you, sir. Yeah, anyway. So we can we can stop it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Anyway, I thought I no, I think that's a good point. I mean, I you know I. There are so many ways, I mean, the, someone said, you know, how, what, being clear on outcome. We still haven't even come up with what, what success looks like. Like, how do we define success? What does it mean to be, a, have a successful citizens' assemblies? Because we all look at it from such different perspectives, you know? 